test tune. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you how I learned how to do this. Um, you know, I had seen, like, when I learned how to do it, they, uh, there was, now there's video available of Sonny Boy doing it. But I had seen a guy named Harmonica Frank Floyd at the University of Chicago in about 1970. And he was, he was a guy like, okay, you guys probably heard uh, the song Tiger Man. Yeah. Right? He's the guy that made I'm not sure if he did the original version of it or from Rufus Thomas, but it was, he was off, he was on Sun Records. And he was an old hillbilly. And he played like that. He could really play like that. I mean, he played all kinds of shit. He played guitar and played the harp in his mouth at the same time. And I had seen pictures of Sonny Boy, uh, you know, and I had heard that he could do that. And I saw, you know, pictures of Wolf trying to do it too. But uh, so what happened when, when the early, early in the days when we first started making records, and um, with Bill Charlie, uh, we went on our first European tours, and we didn't know what we were doing at the time. And these European promoters talked us into. Um, talked us into taking trains everywhere. So, we were riding this, these trains and we were getting up like 6 a.m., 5 a.m., catching a train, and then they, in those days, the gigs in Europe seemed to start at like one in the morning and shit. So, I was just exhausted, man. We, so me and Jay Peterson, the late Jay Peterson was our bass player, we, we try to snag one of these little compartments in the train that had a, a curtain and it had uh, three seats, three and three, three seats one way and three seats the other way facing each other. And we put the armrest up and try to take take a nap, you know, try to snag one for ourselves. And so um, when these trains would stop at different stops and people would get on and they'd peek in the in the compartment to see if there was a room for them to sit down. I'd be late, I'd be just laying across three seats. <laughs> and they just keep walking. <laughs> That's how, that's how I was just practically working on that, man. The, through that whole European tour, man. They came back and I had a good, a good get over. <laughs> so what were we doing? So, okay. It was interesting for me to listen to Jason because that's a whole different way of learning, you know. To, I mean, it's interesting to me to hear it, and I'm sure there's a lot I can learn from it, but um, you know, I hated school. And, uh, so <laughs> It's a lot like school. <laughs> I, I hated school, but that's why I do this shit. So, um, I'm sorry, I feel more relaxed today, so I'm, if anybody was offended when I said shit, I apologize. God, just wait till I talk. <laughs> But you know, also, you might want to, you know, I might say fuck at any time. <laughs> but, so hopefully, you know, you're okay with that. Um, Not a very impressionable age. <laughs> so, so the ways that I have of understanding this stuff is, is I, I, I guess it makes sense because when I made that DVD, you know, people said, yeah, it did make sense, you know, but I don't, you know, I, I know, you know, I know the certain old, you know, I mean, I know the, you know, don't, you know, don't play the major third on the four chord and stuff like that, but, um, 
And how did you learn that? I mean, just by years and years and years of playing. By hearing it. Yeah, by hearing it. By hearing it, you know, by hearing it. You know, you hear it, you can hear it. It's wrong. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds wrong, you know. Right. And, and also, yeah, like what you were talking about with Indian notes. Yeah. You know, that's, I think of it as African notes. You African. know, it's African, it's because it's African that's music, yeah. you know. And, and, you know, so there is, other little notes in the cracks, man. Right. You listen to how much water sings, yeah. and there's all kinds of little pitch graduation and little yeah. um, what they call microtones and you know all that stuff. You know, it's really cool. Uh, I recently I uh, got have gotten to know Alan Wilson's family uh -huh. uh, from Can Heat, the harmonica player from Can Heat, and uh, I got to look at Alan's writings, uh -huh. and he actually developed his own chart of how to notate those microtonal vocal things wow. just for Skip James. Wow. Yeah, that's, wow. How, that's how academic that guy is. That was. guy, yeah, man. Yeah. Boy, he had the right look at him. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But yeah, no, that guy was a great musician, man. And those people were, were scholars, you know. Really. How and, about tongue locking, Rick? Yeah. I mean, when I think of tongue blockers, I think of you. Like, I think that you're like the first cat that, that comes to mind more than Kim, more of anybody today, you know. Well, I think I was playing that way. I, I figured that out from Paul Osher. Paul, when I met, I met Paul when, I, when he first got with Muddy, and I was trying to play Hard, but I wasn't very good. But I had a, a, a not a musical concept, but a <coughs> uh, a concept. I, I wanted to be. This is really stupid that I was young. Okay, I was a teenager. Okay, so forgive me, but it worked out okay. But I wanted to be the realest white guy that ever lived. You know, I wanted. To, I, you know, I couldn't help being white, but I was gonna, yeah. I was gonna do everything I could to not be white. And at the time, I was, I was in a band with uh, Fillmore Slim and Travis Phillips, and um, I remember one time Travis hired a uh, hired a, a white organ player, and he on break and we were working like five nights a week in this one club, and and on the break time. I wouldn't go near the guy. I used to be on the whole other part of the, you know, be in the other side of the club. I was, you know, it's absurd, right? But, you know, it turned out okay. You know, but I was, you know, a confused kid. Did you, um, did you ever lit purse? I mean. Yes, I did. I did. I, I started by doing that. And then what happened? Uh, I heard Paul, and not so, you know, I saw him when he played with Muddy, and it was, a, it was just like, because I had this idea in my head, because my sister had Jimmy Reed records, and she had, and I, I loved the music, and it was something, and I had this idea in my head that I wanted to be that, you know, the most authentic guy I could, you know. Uh, that was my goal, you know, and that was going to be my ticket, man, fuck school and all that. I was going to, you know, I was going to, you know, play arcane Negro folk music on a child's toy. And, uh, you know, that would be my, that was going to be my ticket, you know. So, uh, so smart. Yeah. 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 Sounds like a really good picture. It worked out okay, but you know, that's why, I, I don't know if you guys ever saw the cartoon of the character Mr. Magoo. But that, hey, right here. Anyway. Did they call you that? No, just, just, just no, no, they didn't call me. I, I, had, I had a girlfriend call me that, and my old lady called me that, but, but, but because, man, I just walked through everything, oblivious, man, and just, you know, in a fantasy, and, it, it all worked out okay. So, um, but I, I, I saw Paul with Muddy when he first joined Muddy, and the band was uh, SP, Larry on drums, 
and then uh, Luther Johnson, but the, not the one that was entered in the 70s, but um, Snake Johnson, Mr. Georgia Boy, Snake Johnson, um, Sammy Lawhorn, Otis Spann, um, and Pee Wee Madison. They had three guitar players, and they would switch off playing bass before they had Sonny Wonder. And um, so I saw this band, and they were up there wearing uh, red brocade navy jackets with gold medallions. And except then you know, Muddy was wearing a suit, but the rest of them were in their uniform, you know, black slacks. And, and, and I was looking at these guys, man, and looking at it, and these, back then, I mean, Pee Wee Madison, and especially with Snake Johnson, they were the, just the most evil looking guys, man. And just, and just up there looking like they'd kill you, man, and just barely rocking back and forth to the groove, you know. And, and, and every once in a while, like the light, you know, the stage lights would hit a little bit of a gold tooth and that would snap sneer at the audience or something. And, I, and then, you know, my sick mind, I was like, God, that was the coolest shit in the world. I just like that. You know? so, so, and, and here's Paul up there. He was like 21 or something, or 20, and I, I was I, at the time I was like 16 or 17, and I'm, and I was looking at that, and seeing Paul up there, and I already had that idea that that was what I wanted to be, and then I see this guy doing it, you know, and I met him, you know, that night. We've been friends ever since, but he, on the break, he started playing. And I can remember what he played. I can't play it just like him, but this, you know, I couldn't detect it so much, you know, through an amplifier and stuff. But on the break, he started playing like, texture in there, yeah. all those little little beats and things and all that little percussive stuff underneath and I I didn't know what it was but I knew that was different in the way you know I knew that was something that that made it sound like the real stuff to me you know? yeah. and 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 what he was doing was was tongue blocking and it's uh, used to, I don't know if they have these anymore, but yeah. it used to be when you bought the harmonica, yeah. there was a little thing in there until you had to put Mary had a little lamb or something. I thought that was for squares, so I had, I just threw it out. And then yeah. I didn't know about tongue blocking until um, 2004. Like, I knew that you guys were doing it, like, putting, by, by tongue blocking, I mean blocking a couple of notes and only playing one, right? So like, not not this kind of, not this kind of, not the octaves, but the. So you, you can hear I'm playing single notes, but I'm tongue blocking. And it gives it that little chunky sound. So I didn't even know the guys were bent. I didn't think it was possible to bend. And until like, I don't know however long ago, 2004, when Dennis Grunling was the one who told and me. He can overblow them. He can overblow tongue blocking, yeah. yeah. And he, so like, he's the one who showed me. And then I was like, cause that Sonny Boy lick, the. <laughs> Right? Like, for years, uh, like, like, check this out, this is all lip pursing, believe it or not, right? Because for years I didn't know that, Simulate. I didn't, yeah, so I was like... <laughs> That's all yeah, lip pursing. Yeah, no. <clears throat> yeah. I, I could do that too, because later on, 
I, it, I started just going back and forth and and because it seemed to me and I still believe this I can get a little better articulation on the second hole um, mm -hmm. with my lips so yeah you just Some of that was tongue blocking, but, but you know, you could, just, I call that like when you're simulating tongue blocking, I call it like slipping, slipping the note, you know. Yeah. Like I said, I was oblivious to anything, and I just thought I belonged there. So when I first moved to Chicago, I went to this guy who found me. I don't know how he latched on, but he was he said he was Junior Wells' brother, but I'm pretty sure he was lying. And, <laughs> and he uh, took me around, and it was like, um, you know, like I was some kind of, you know, he took me around like I was some kind of an oddity, like. Yeah. Like, oh, here's a little just white boy, you know, he can, he can, you know, play, play harmonica. So he, he took me all over the place. He took me to uh, Pepper's Rock, and he wouldn't let me go. I mean, I, we were up for like two, two days, with never stopping. Just he'd take me to different places, after hours places, and people's houses where they sold, you know, after hours booze and had card games and shit like that. But. He took me to Pepper's Lounge on 43rd and Vincennes, in the original Pepper's Lounge. And that night, Cotton's band was playing, and it was the, <clears throat> the band, like, um, Alberta was gone, but it was still Luther Tucker and Bobby Anderson. And he told that, that thing was Cotton's before, before Matt Murphy was in it. And Cotton's band was playing, and it was, uh, birthday party for some girlfriend of Junior Wells. So all these people were there. So uh, at one point during the night, they just started playing like like the figure from my babe, but staying on the one, kind of like Teenage Beat or something, but, but uh, in F. And, and somehow it ended up where it was Cotton and Junior Wells and Big Walter and um, Carrie Bell and Charlie Musselwhite and then this guy shoved me up there too. Nice. <laughs> and, 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 we, and we were just all lined. And it was a very uh, long, shallow bandstand. And so we were just all lined up all in a row. And we're just passing one B flat hard ball up and down the line. Yeah. <laughs> it was cool, man. Yeah. It was cool. And, and and like I said, I was so delusional then. I just thought, shit, yeah, I belong up here, you know. <laughs> it was, uh, but yeah, think about it now. But you, in those days, you never gave it a thought, you know. Yeah. To, uh, 
playing people's hearts. Yeah. Didn't mean nothing. And so I still I'm, do it. I, I'm, I'm still, still like that. Yeah, I don't absolutely. care, but there ain't too many other people like me except for you, you know. Yeah. They don't give a shit. I'm afraid, I think the harmonica is afraid of what it's going to get from me. <laughs> <laughs> what were we going to do? Oh, I don't know. Um, I just wanted to, like, ask you some more questions about tongue blocking. So, like, for me, like, it was so hard because, I, I mean, maybe for some of you too, like, you're sitting there and you're thinking about, you're hearing about this embouchure, and you're hearing people talk about how important it is. And, and you might be thinking to yourself, well, this is nuts. I just spent 20 or however many years learning how to play, and now you're telling me that the way I'm playing is wrong. So that's, that's how I took it at first when Dennis told me that, you know, like basically like Portnoy and some of those guys sat with me and said, you know, we're tongue blockers and you should be too. And I took it as like, no, like this is a bad thing and I'd have to relearn how to play. So what it took for me to be able to get, have fun with it, with, well, I mean, to get good at it was I had to learn how to have fun with it. Like, I had to fall in love with the sound of it. And for me, like, just the slap on the three, just the... It, it, to me, it's not about it being a bigger tone, because I can lip purse it pretty big, too. That's lip pursing. And here's tongue blocking. I mean, I think my tone's big both ways, but there's something about the tongue blocking tone that like, I had to just sit with it in my house and on my porch and just be in me and then in order to fall in love with it, like on my own time. To, to me, I think of the way I uh, perceive that thing that I think you're talking about is, it feels rooted to my whole body. Yeah. It's when your tongue's on there, yeah. you feel you're more grounded. Connected. It's more just solid. Yeah. And, and, and it's a, a slightly, um, I can simulate that, that sound with, with my lips, but, there's, but it's a slightly bassier sound. Yeah. It, you know. and, and also, um, you know, even not slapping, just... You know, that's all, you know, that's with my tongue in. And I found that um, it's not just your tongue, you know, that embouchure for me, what Jason's talking about, um, it's not just your playing your, with your tongue on there out of the corner of your mouth. But it's also, um, there's a lot of just uh, um, muscles, little muscles in your face and in your muzzle and in your neck and stuff when you're shaping these notes that, that go into it. You know, there's a... And I, and I, and I, I had an, 
it got me so excited because I, I was getting closer to cotton. Yeah. Getting closer to cotton sound and, and I and I remember um, when I first heard like I had that James Cotton first James Cotton blues band record. And then I discovered and I dug it dug the shit out of it, it was a it, uh, it was such a huge tone I, I couldn't imagine. I didn't know how I could ever even approximate that. And then I heard um, the one that really just killed me, just I, I had to learn it, I mean, was um, when I got that Chicago the Blues today with Cotton on it. Man, you don't have that? Oh my God. I'm gonna, this is going to change your life. Yeah? It, was, it was so killer, man. It was, it was called the Jimmy Cotton Quartet. And it was while he was still in Muddy, but right when he was about to leave. And it was an SP and Span and Pee Wee Madison, no, no bass player. And it was just one guitar. And man, the stuff that he plays on there is just so fierce. Yes. And, and I and I and I had, you know, I was kind of an angry kid <laughs> and I and I wanted to scare people <laughs> with my plan. And that was some frightening sounding stuff, man. Yeah, like it was just just fierce and also it had this um what I call like what Cotton does, it, it just, it's his own way of doing it, but every, everybody that's good, I think, does this in their own way, but has this flexible time, you know, just this, a little, almost like a, a drunk or something, that it just, it just it creates this, in, this impression of uh, suspense, like yeah. you don't know where it's gonna, well, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And then you end up in the right place. And Charlie Davies like that a lot, man. Yeah. So, but it. it was just the, the coolest stuff in the world. So I wanted to be able to do that so bad. And I just locked myself in. A, you know, I just, got, you got to obsess. So if you want to really be good, you got to be OCD. Yeah. You know, if you're not, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well said. I mean, I, I, I know like the the attract. You know, I, I, like I said initially, I was I was a little put off by the whole thing. Um, I felt like there was a whole camp of people that were against me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Of course. I could help you. <laughs> yeah, it did and stuff. But for me, like the what you said about it being like a grounding thing, mm -hmm. that really resonated resonated home with me because it's a rhythm in the, the flexible time thing the rhythmic thing if i'm i'm feeling i'm getting more of a snare drum sound on the instrument if i'm like take this like little you hear guitar players do this a lot like i'll play it first lip pursing started tongue blocking it that I was getting better rhythm. Like the embouchure itself was asking, was making me to do better rhythmic things in the swing sense. Like because it takes like a little longer to put the tongue on there, my playing started to relax more and I started to groove more. And instead of just so square, I started, you know, you know what I mean? A little yeah, yeah, just dragging it or like, instead of, so like, I do a lot of this. And I can't do it lip person. 
It doesn't sound it. It's like I'm my own band. Yeah. And when I was in jail, I knew I wasn't going to be able to play very good when I got out because I was doing the year. So, and they don't let you have harmonicas. So I just practiced. And when I got out, I still had some chops. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's good. Yeah, you can do a lot without the heart. I can remember uh, when I first, like, who was it was saying this? I think it was Winslow. Yeah, Winslow yesterday was talking about this side to side tongue thing. I can't do it. Right? And he was saying, either, you know, you can either do it or you can't. Well, I can't, but I learned to do it fast enough to where it sounds good and steady enough to where it now. That's amazing. And, yeah. And, 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 well, no, but, but you know, it's no big deal. But some people can just naturally do it. I didn't. You know, some people can just naturally do it. But I, I wanted to do it, and I, and I needed to do it, and I just. So what I would do, I would just all day just sit there inside my mouth, just going, you know, you know, just. Going back and forth, back and so forth. So are you doing it side to side? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and I just just kept practicing, 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 trying to keep it steady and fast as I could do it. And it very fr that was the most frustrating thing I ever tried to learn on the harp. And I never learned it. Well, it, you know, I learned it as good as you just heard, but but um, it's it's not natural to me. But I can tell you this. I don't know if no, no, I won't tell you this, but go ahead. <laughs> no, I was, I was oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I was yeah. trying to do it okay. again. Yeah. yeah, so I thought for a second yeah. maybe I would do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so how about them pelicans? How about the pelicans? <laughs> no, I just changed the subject man, because I don't want to I, yeah, I was Still about there. to get inappropriate. No, go ahead, get in. <laughs> We're not friends. About the what? The mirror. The mirror? Mm -hmm. Oh, what are you doing in the mirror? What are you doing? Oh, wait, no, no. Me? Oh. No, no. No, I would just, you know, you can't see it, but with my mouth closed, I'm just standing around waiting in line at the supermarket or driving somewhere or something. I would just, just keep, just going back and forth, back and forth until I, you know, that helped. You know, then I when it was you know, or I just just practicing, and it drove. It was so frustrating, so frustrating, man. Cause, but you know, that's what I wanted to do. And it was a little like when I was new and I was trying to learn a vibrato, and I wanted to get that vibrato yeah. like cotton and it just sounded so ominous, you know, and. And I couldn't do it, and I couldn't do it. But with the vibrato, I just kept trying and trying and trying. To, and you, you need to be like, with learning a lot of stuff on the harp, um, technique kind of stuff, you need to be like a, a, a detective almost. And, and you're making all these little minute adjustments and, and just trial and error, and you just, Somebody might be able to point you in the right direction, tell you something that could help you, but you, there's just these little, little minuscule differences that could be the thing, you know, could be the thing you're looking for. So, you know, so there's no substitute for just keep it in your mouth. Keeping it in your mouth. And it really, you really don't need to do hours and hours like we did. I mean, we recognize that most of you are too intelligent to make a decision to become a professional harmonica player, <laughs> which is why you actually have all the all the professional harmonica players that are here are basically here for free in one way or another, or getting paid. <laughs> and that's why you have money to come here, is that you haven't made that decision. <laughs> you know, more people have been to the moon 
than have made a living playing this instrument. <laughs> Think about that. And half of our band. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and also, the, the other thing that, well, you know, like I said, you need to be OCD, but it also really helps if you got no skills and no education. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I don't know about Jason, I'm sure he can, well, I can no. tell, he's, he has some teaching skills. I was a I, smart kid, but that, then a dumb adult. Yeah, I, 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 they, uh, you know, they always told me I was smart and I could, you know, do well on tests if it wasn't, you know, it was just a, but yeah, they, I was, I never, according to the, them, I was never living up to my potential. <laughs> it was your attitude. And your attitude. My ad I had a poor attitude. Yeah. Talk to the neighbors. About my attitude. My attitude was kind of like, who are you looking at? <laughs> there's a lot of got, there's a lot of stories what? about Rick. <laughs> hey, you want some of this? <laughs> Yeah, but it's not actually funny. Like, <laughs> like, like you were like, you're lucky you're not in prison. Oh, you, man. Like, you should be in prison yeah. just for shit that happened to people I know. <laughs> yes. I, I was a confused youngster and, and a young adult. And, and I, I was, yeah, I, mean, I was an idiot. Man. I did some stuff that just... I, I, I'm not a. Prison I, for it. Yeah, that I should, should have gone, should have been under the prison for it ever, you know. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually, I mean, we're joking about it now and stuff, but some pretty heavy stuff, man, that uh, turned out. Absurdly well for me. <laughs> turned out just fine, and uh, it's crazy. Apparently, there's a market for that stuff. Pardon me? Apparently, there's a market for that stuff. There's a market for debauchery. Yeah, debauchery. Oh, well, I mean, I guess you know, maybe, but I try not to. You know, I just people, some people know about it, and some people don't. But. I'm just, you know, I try to make up for it. You know, I'm, I am a bad guy today. I've been all right for quite a while. <laughs> so, so, like, so like um, um, are there any things that you practice that are not, like, songs? Like, or not just jamming? Like, do you have any, like, scales or lick exercise, like a lick or something that you do to warm up? Like, when, like, what do you do before a gig? If it, like, say it's been a week or two since you had a harmonica in your mouth. And you got a gig in you know in an hour or something. You know you should probably get the harp in your mouth before the gig, a little, at least a little bit, you know, so you're not first putting it on your in your mouth for the first time in a week on stage. Which you know I've been there lots of times. Like you know, like I love music and everything, but like when you play 300 days a year, you come home and you set your harmonicas at the front door and you don't pick them up until you leave out again. You know, and that's how I used to be when I was young, but now I play a lot more because I have a more balanced life, so I'm not gone as much, but what is it that you go to to see how, where am I at with my own music? Where am I at with my relationship to the instrument? Because for me, it's that scale shit, because the reason I do that scale stuff is I know what the scale's supposed to sound like, not the way Lil Walter's supposed to sound like on the scale, but just the way I sound when I play the scale. So like, it's the same lick, whether it's a scale or a lick, it's just a name. Yeah. It's the same grouping of notes that I kind of go up and down. Do you have anything like that that you do? It would probably behoove me to do that. I'd probably be better off doing that, but I never, I, I can't remember ever doing that. How do, you, uh, how do you deal with confidence issues like, I mean, like today, you know, like there's so many good harmonica players and there's so, some of them are like 20 and 16 and from Russia and they can play like Howard Levy shit and Portnoy and everybody, yeah. you know, like how do you deal with the confidence issues of when you're going up on stage? Because to me, it seems like you're so involved in the drums that that's your, the way you get out of it is you're, you go rhythmic. And, but I mean, that's my guess of what your answer would be, but what's the real answer? 
Um, but that's some, that's a good question, and that's a, there's a, I don't know if there's an easy answer because I'm I could get you know really mental over stuff, you know, and I can it doesn't just, seem like you do though. Yeah. It doesn't seem like you right. I get really uh, yeah because you know I have confidence issues, you know, yeah. I have. Uh, insecurities and stuff like that like when we were talking earlier about when I was young and I just felt like I belonged up there and everything but that didn't wow. carry me through life yeah uh, you know and, and I once I got a little sense I started having doubts right and and um, one thing that helps me to get past that stuff is I've, you know, I've been doing this so long. I've developed me as a as a performer, and and what I do is not just playing the harmonica. You know, I got a whole catalog of songs that I wrote that the people like, and yeah. nobody else does them, right. and and I know how to do them. And so people being come you, to see, being me is the thing, and I and I think I play like me and I and I I'm just me you know so I'm just getting paid for being myself so I'm not in competition with a guy so much like like Jason for example who can just play all kinds of stuff that I couldn't even think of but but I just play what I play the way I play it you know and and, and I you know and in that little narrow range I'm pretty looking good yeah you know? <laughs> trying to learn how to play. I was, you know, I got like Charlie McCoy records and I was trying to play all kinds, you know, just because I wanted to learn the harmonica, you know. But then I zeroed in on just being myself. And I think that helps. And, and when, you know, the other thing that helps me is history. When I, because uh, I get, man, I get, I get, very neurotic, like in, especially recording. I get when I'm making a record. It's very hard for me to to um, put my brain aside and not have, and and and, and you know because I start thinking about oh God, you know this is going to be there forever and every, yeah. you know everybody's going to hear it and everybody's going to be listening and critiquing it and all that stuff, you know. I've sort of got over that a little bit just because, and I know no, you know nobody really gives a shit. And, yeah. and, 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 and CDs have become landfill anyway at this point. So it's in history. So so um, but sometimes um, it's just oh you know. Grow some genitals, man. Just be, you know, I just gotta tell myself, you know what? So what? You, you know, you're anxious. You feel tense. You gotta, you know, you feel like somebody just punched you in the stomach, and you don't know how you're gonna face it and all that stuff. Well, you know what? Hey, you know, big deal. So what? You know, you just gotta, you just gotta do it. And normally, when I am. Uh, when I'm in a on a gig that I'm a little nervous about, like um, maybe there's you know other acts on the gig right. and you wanna and you wanna you know you really wanna do well and you really want, but normally when I'm on on a gig I can after once you start playing, it all that tension goes away and sometimes. It's channeled all that, all that. Uh, I, I mean, that stuff is useful almost. I, I don't think it's going to be, and, but sometimes when I think, I, I don't know how I'm going to face it, and oh my God, and all that, and how am I going to ever get up there and do this? Something else happens, and, and um, sometimes I feel like. A, I just got let out of a cage, and when I 
all of a sudden we're on the bandstand and I feel like just like ah, this is where you know. And I feel yeah, feel really that's what it feels like is I just got let out, I just got released from a cage. Yeah, I don't know that, yeah but I'm nuts. I might write a song every year. That's what I used to do. When, you know, before we were making records, I might write a song every year or something. And you know, when something happened, something happened to occur to me that I thought would be a good song. I, um, and then once we started making records, then I had a demand. You know, it's kind of old Charlie would be on my ass, man. You know, you, you got you know. Uh, you got any songs, we've got to make record, you know. Yeah. And I, yeah. I'm like, uh, uh, so it would, I'd have to get on it. And what I found out, I learned this after my our first album. There was like 10 songs on there, five covers, five you know, kind of obscure covers, and then five original songs. And the album was pretty well received and all that. And, and, and then, you know, we started touring, and then it was time to make another record. And I was like, oh shit, you know, and I, and I also felt this pressure of, well, it's got to be of a certain quality. And it's good as the last one. Yeah, yeah, it's good or better, you know, and all that, right? So, um, what I found out, what I learned from that was I can induce <coughs> inspiration. I don't have to wait to be inspired. But I have to, uh, in, I can induce inspiration by sitting and, and getting anxious. And just <laughs> sitting and being and going out of my mind and thinking and I'm just, you know, and until fine, if I can endure enough frustration for long enough, something's gonna kick in, something's gonna happen. And, and, and it would give me some momentum and the, 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 the whatever thought occurred to me, whatever, however long it took, that would get me excited. And then I got something to start with, you know. So, um, and, and I also, I've read a lot of things about songwriting, you know, like biographies of different songwriters and stuff like that, not so much how-to books, but yeah. biographies of different guys. And one thing that I really identified with, and it made me feel good because I'll, there's a couple of books. One book is called um, Tune Smith by Jimmy Webb. And that's a real good, it's, it's, it's his, it's a autobiography, but it also talks about his different techniques of you know, different ways of writing songs and what was so great about that to me was I realized, wow, that's all stuff I've already, I discovered on my own, you know, and stuff I already did. And, and, and another thing that I saw a quote from a guy named Yip Harburg, who wrote like Somewhere Over the Rainbow and a bunch of stuff like that, you know, it's a Tin Pan Alley, Broadway kind of guy. <clears throat> and, and it was an interview with him and the, Interviewer asked him, well, "How do you think of all that stuff?" And he said, oh, shit, "Nothing to it. Uh, I just sit down and stare at a blank piece of paper until blood comes out of my forehead." <laughs> <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's you know that's what you do, man. And and oh, I can t another thing too. When, when we had to make that second record and I was I was talking to a guy and I was going, oh God, I gotta think of all these songs and I made like 12 songs and I'm gonna, you know, and I 
it's got to be this and it's got to be that. No, I don't have anything. And the guy goes, why don't you try starting one? Yeah. And, and that was helpful. And then another friend of mine, when I was bitching about it, told me, he said, you know, if it was easy, everyone would be rich. Yeah. So, you know, it's, and, and the other thing that I won't say, no, nah, I won't say it. <laughs> you kill it, man. Come on. Go ahead. Do it. And, you know, You're a like, friend. okay, I'll sit. This is just my opinions, and this has nothing to do with harmonicas, especially, but. So the Beatles, in some respects, ruined music because. Ooh, everybody got quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you how. After that, and with the advent of, you know, hippies and all that stuff that came in after the Beatles, you know, and you weren't legitimate if you didn't write your own songs, right? You, that you, you weren't, you, you know, Sinatra didn't write his own songs, Elvis didn't write his own songs, you know, Nat Cole didn't write his own songs. <laughs> And I think those people were legitimate. But for some, you know, because of the Beatles' popularity, you had to write your own songs, you know. And the Rolling Stones, they did pretty well with it. And, and, and different other people that came along in the Beatles' wake uh, did well with it. And the Beatles were great, man, you know, great songwriters and great everything. But, um, because of that, you know, you want you all of a sudden you're not legitimate if you don't write your own songs, and and everybody ain't a songwriter. And I mean, because I get all kinds of <clears throat> stuff, man. People give me stuff and give me, oh man, this is perfect. I wrote this with you in mind. This is perfect. I really want you to, you know, chat. Please, what do you think? And all that, and you gotta. Then I gotta get creative and go, you know, come up with some, you know, yeah, man, I really did what you, you know, I did what you're trying to do, you know, come up with some. I was reading, a, reading an interview with Nick Moss, and uh, he said that for his last record, he just tried to imagine you, how you would have wrote ten songs. Did you hear that? No, I didn't. Yeah, it's in print. I didn't. Yeah, he wrote Nick Moss, who's a famous, who played with Jimmy Rogers. And uh, who I, I also heard that you are Jimmy Rogers' favorite harmonica. Oh, really? I, oh, you Nick told me that too. That, that story? Yeah, yeah, he told me that too. I can I don't know why. I only played with Jimmy Rogers once <coughs> at Ma B's when he was just, just starting once? at 20 years. Thank you.